Hi everyone and welcome back to what is now my fourth attempt at recording lecture part three for today's series on the art of mystery cults. Now in this part of the lecture I'm going to be discussing the goddess Sibylle or Magna Mater as she's known by the Romans and her consort Attis. And to complicate a little bit the picture that I was talking about in the previous two lectures where we saw these mystery cults playing out on the walls of a house um, in domestic space and talked a little bit about the ways that um, individuals and local communities might be celebrating these mystery cults at someone's house, for example, or in a temple that is placed sort of on the outside boundaries of the religious space of the city, right outside of the um, official state sanctioned religious practice of the Roman world. Um, so Sibylle and Addis are a little bit different. They share a lot of aspects with mystery cults, such as an interest in sort of ecstatic um, moments of standing outside yourself, right? Ecstasis to stand outside oneself. So ecstatic behaviors um, and also uh, rulership over things like fertility. Um, so there are a lot of things that are shared with mystery cults in the cult of Sibylianatus, but they are actually officially state sanctioned and brought into the official practice of the Roman world um, through a sort of juridical process, through a process of um, legal um, sanctioning. And that happened in 205 BC, right? So in the sort of mid to late Republican period, we see this goddess whose roots are really in the Near East, um, Sibylle, who is, uh, you know, a bit of a successor to the Ishtar Inanna, uh, Mistress of the Beasts, uh, snake goddess type, right? She is a, a goddess with multiple aspects to her. She is both um, of the sort of um, protective realm, the sphere of controlling wild animals, and also the sphere of a sort of um, mother goddess of fertility as well. Um, and so what happened in 205 BC is that we have the Romans engaged in the Carthaginian Wars, and they are not doing very well against their um, neighbors down on the northern coast of Africa and the sort of western coast of Asia. And um, during the Carthaginian Wars, the Romans decided that they needed to consult their oracular text, um, which is the Sibylline books. And this, or um, the origin of the Sibylline books is a myth sort of from the deep, um, deepest parts of Roman history during the reign of the kings. Uh, and these books were supposedly brought by uh, some sort of sorceress to the state. Um, and she offered them for an enormous sum they were turned down, uh, she burned half of them, she brought them back, offered them for an even more enormous sun, sum of money. Um, the same thing happened and then eventually the Romans kind of caught on and were like, wait, this seems really important, maybe I should pay for these books. Um, so the Sibylline texts become a really important source for sorting out what the Romans should do in times of crisis. And so they consult the books and the books say, bring this goddess Sibylle from the east to Rome. Not so directly, they're oracular texts, but that is how they are interpreted. Um, so they send a ship, and this ship takes the Great Mother Goddess and moves her from either Pergamum or Pessinos. Uh, there's something, it's not quite clear where the goddess, goddess's home was at this time. Um, and she is brought via ship to Ostia and then up the Tiber into Rome. Um, this is a big deal, right? The evocatio, the calling out of a goddess from one city to another so that her official cult home is in a different place. Um, and she officially gives her protection to a new space. Uh, it's not unheard of in the Roman world. They've done it before, but they've never done it on quite such a scale where the goddess is coming from so far away. Um, so it's something of an anomaly for the Romans to do this. And it ends up creating a little bit of cultural tension um, because Sibylle is not a goddess of the types that the Romans are used to. The first thing that is strange about her is that here we see this antifix from Ostia showing the goddess coming in a boat. Um, the goddess had no statue form at this time. She was a black meteorite, so a rock. Uh, so they are transporting this goddess rock um, instead of a cult statue that looks like a human to Rome. Once there, and we see this in what the Romans do, the idea of worshipping a rock is somewhat um, odd, right? Even nymphs and sort of personifications of natural features always take on this human form, this anthropomorphic form. We see this with the Greeks and with the Romans really strongly. Um, and the Romans and the Greeks are also suspicious of people like the Egyptians who worship animal gods, right? So um, there's a little bit of tension here. 
So what they do is they take this rock and they put the rock into a statue so that the rock is the face of the statue. So she has a female body now. She's officially a nice anthropomorphized goddess with a rock face. Um, so sort of embodying in the cult statue in her form in Rome that tension between what is normal for a state religion and what is more normal for something uh, like a mystery cult, something that is not as embroiled in these societal large-scale structural notions. Um, so that is the Sibylle herself. She is then ensconced in the city of Rome and um, along with her come all sorts of accoutrements of her worship, uh, her priesthood, and her attributes. And so in the next section I just want to show you some images of Sibylle so that you can become familiarized with her. Um, and as I mentioned before, she has a very long history reaching back into the cultures of the Near East. Um, so we have two representations here from Turkey, one that is more Hellenized in its artistic style and one that is more formally composed in the Near Eastern style. Um, in both cases, we can see she is wearing this sort of crown that looks like a city wall. And the city crown is one of her main attributes that we will see again and again in depictions of her. In fact, in this late classical relief that we see here, Sibylle also has a city crown right on the break if you look closely at this image. In these other depictions of Sibylle that we can see here, um, we see some other attributes of hers, including her flanking lions. And often, as I mentioned before, she has this association with these Near Eastern and Cycladic goddesses, especially those who are involved in this sort of taming of the beasts, control over the wild forces of nature. And so we see her frequently ensconced, either flanked by lions in a throne or actually drawn in a chariot uh, by a pair of male lions. Um, so Sibylle herself is pretty recognizable as a goddess with her city crown, her lions, um, and she does not come alone. She also has this consort that I mentioned briefly before, the god Attis. Now Attis is a Phrygian god with a really interesting history. So he is born when a hermaphroditic demon named Adgistus so frightens the Olympian gods that they order Adgistus's male genitalia to be cut off. And from the blood of this castration grows an almond tree to which the nymph Nana comes and she picks an almond, she puts it in her bosom, and then the almond becomes sort of absorbed into her body and becomes a pregnancy. She gives birth to a child, um, this is Atis, and sh this child she immediately abandons and is then raised by goats, and he grows up to be a really handsome shepherd youth. At which point Adgistus, who is now in a different guise, and this guise is Sibylle, Adgistus sees the beautiful youth, youth Atis, falls in love, and becomes super obsessed um, with Atis. And Atis is then sent off to marry a mortal woman, a princess. Um, but Sibylle, becoming really enraged and um, jealous about this, sends them all into an ecstatic frenzy at the wedding, and both Atis and his father-in-law self-castrate on the spot. Addis then bleeds out, he dies, and Sibylle is so upset that she asks the gods um, to keep him sort of beautiful and young looking forever. Um, so from this story, from this double castration uh, of both Adgistus, which then becomes Sibylle, and of Attis at the wedding, um, and then Attis's death after that castration resulting in him becoming a god later on, at least in the Roman tradition, um, these ideas are really tied up with the life cycles of birth, death, and fertility of seasonality, right? So we have um, uh, death and winter, we have the seeding through blood of, into spring, um, we have growth and rebirth into this cycle. So um, Attis then is represented oftentimes as a sort of sexless god. Here we see a statue that was set up at the mouth of the Tiber River in Rome, um, where Attis has no fig leaf, Attis has no genitalia. So the castration of Attis is a really important piece of him becoming a sort of vegetation god, a god of fertility, um, and a consort of his sort of mother, Sibylle. So there's a lot in there that the Romans don't really find comforting. Um, Romans are not into things like ecstasy, castration, and um, mother-son relationships. All of those things are quite uncomfortable for Roman society. Um, 
So nonetheless, they're in a situation now where they've called out this goddess. She, this is her home. She is protecting Rome. They win, you know, survive the Carthaginian Wars. And so um, she's sort of a proven uh, important piece of Roman culture at this point. But coming along with her is this sort of odd consort story. She's a meteorite. And then there's one more interesting step here, which is, um, this is just another image of Attis and Sibylle together on a patera, is her priesthood. And so the priesthood of Sibylle is even sort of more um, odd to the Roman mind because they actually uh, practice a lot of the actions that Attis did at his wedding. Um, so the the they are called Gali, G A L L I, um, and they accompany Sibylle and are the people sort of in charge of performing the rites and rituals for her cult and maintaining her cult. Um, but they are really controversial in Roman society. Um, a subset of Gali would self castrate at uh, ecstatic religious ceremonies in honor of Magna Mater, for example. They would dress, as you can see here in this votive statue, um, this votive relief. Um, they would dress in women's clothing. Uh, so these are they are all men. Most of them are eunuchs, or some of them are eunuchs. It's actually really unclear what number of priests actually self castrated um, and to what extent this was just something that the Romans were so uncomfortable with that they made it into a bigger deal um, and a more common sounding thing than it actually was. Um, but so they would wear these really elaborate costumes and they would engage in sort of ecstatic behaviors like dancing in the streets. Um, and um, here you can see some of the symbols and musical instruments that would be used as part of these um, ceremonies. And they also engaged in, here you can see, a, a bone whip, self-flagellation and self-harm activities. So all of this was very strange for the Romans because there's one thing with having a story that is a little bit uncomfortable in the realm of myth. And it's very different when you have actual people on the streets of the city engaging in behaviors that are so far outside of Roman societal norms. Um, so the existence of Gali was um, at times outlawed, right? So self-castration and castration was outlawed at different times throughout the Roman Empire. Um, because of the sort of discomfort with the cult of Magna Mater in particular. But as we can see, there are an awful lot of reliefs, uh, an awful lot of uh, depictions of these Gali, enough that we know that it is also an important aspect of Roman culture um, and one that would be visible to people. So this, in, in the mystery cult of uh, Sibylle or Magna Mater here, we see high level of visibility from the priests who are very overtly um, crossing the norms of societal behavior in a way that um, perhaps people are doing at these Dionysiac ceremonies we saw at the Villa of the Mysteries in a more clandestine and secretive space. Um, so the sort of ecstatic attitudes and rites and uh, rituals maybe involving pain and things like that that are characteristic of mystery cults get carried over into a more public sphere with Magna Mater and her introduction into the official pantheon of Roman society. Um, so that is Magna Mater and her cult and her consort Attis. And what I want you to do now is to just take a few minutes, respond to the following questions in two to three sentences each. Um, the first is, how does the cult of Sibylle or Magna Mater compare with what you know about the Dionysiac and Bacchic cult, such as you saw in the Villa of the Mysteries? And are there any features beyond what I already talked about that they share in common? Um, and then B, in the images of Gali in this presentation, do you notice any similarities in the style of the way that they are presented to sort of popular art that we were discussing a couple weeks ago? And why do you think the artists may or may not have adopted this idiom? So what do you sort of think about the stylistic representation um, of the cult of Magna Mater on the part of Gali and their particular um, representations versus the more um, state-sponsored representations of these figures that we see in public spaces. All right, I hope uh, everything is going well for you all, and I will see you in the next lecture.